there is a little bit more information about what happened in Armenia throughout the course of this year. So to fill that gap, we have a very distinguished panel today with the first time information about developments in Armenia, featuring Foreign Minister His Excellency Zohra Manatsakanyan, Clement Gule, UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of to Freedom of Peaceful Assembly and of Association, who has recently been to Armenia and prepared a report that would be presented tomorrow with his insights and recommendations. Mr. Arman Tatoyan, Human Rights Defender of the Republic of Armenia, who will present the views on the current state of affairs in Armenia from a perspective of NIHRIs. So uh, I would like to encourage you to engage with the speakers in uh, Q&A section, session very actively and making your, putting your questions and your comments after their speeches. Without further ado, I'll pass the floor to His Excellency Minister of Foreign Affairs. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Andrenik. Uh, and uh, I thank you all very much for uh, turning up at this uh, event uh, that uh, our ambassador Andrenik has uh, organized. Uh, it is now more than a year, slightly more than a year since those uh, events uh, took place in Armenia, which have become to be known to the world as the Velvet Revolution, non-violent, peaceful revolution of love and solidarity. And there is a lot of meaning in that. Um, I'm really very grateful that uh, the, the Special Rapporteur on the right to the freedom of uh, peaceful assembly uh, Mr. Clement Boulet, Clement, thank you very much for joining us uh, today. And I'm also very, very grateful that Arman Tatoyan, our Ombudsman, our Human Rights Defender, has also uh, taken effort to travel and join us today at this event. Um, there will be an exhibition opening uh, in a few hours, at 4 o'clock, uh, uh, in front of room 20. Uh, which will also enrich our discussion with some imagery, some uh, more sort of graphic expression of the spirit that was overwhelming uh, Armenia last year. Um, I'm sure that there will be a lot more analysis, more research about how exactly why and what happened in Armenia. Um, you know, I am also, I have my own <coughs> emotional sentiment about all this in that I have spent six years in, in this building in the UN Geneva dealing with human rights when Armenia was a member of the Human Rights Commission. I have spent time in the Council of Europe when Armenia was uh, <coughs> going through a deep crisis of the tragedy of 2008. Uh, in my personal experience, I've dealt extensively with the professions in the field of human rights, both from within the UN system, the, I think we benefit from our membership in uh, European regional organizations of which the Council of Europe and the OSC are, uh, are, 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 are very good examples and which have uh, a very, very big chunk of human rights related activity. <coughs> we have been working, I see my good friend there, uh, the deputy head uh, of of the European Union here with whom uh, we have spent also quite some time in, uh, discussing and deliberating on these matters. Uh, it was interesting, in my view, the Armenian public has that, you know, has that propensity to protest which is uh, perfectly normal. The whole point was about the quality of protest, and the evolution of protest, and the maturity of protest, the capacity of, the, of all the institutions to uh, generate this process in a way that our country could absorb such shock. 
it all started in March with the march <laughs> of uh, the future Prime Minister which uh, mobilized the public support. By 8 May, on 8 May, he was elected Prime Minister. On the 9th of May, life continued in Armenia as it was. This, is, this was a very important uh, demonstration of this maturity of the various institutions of the public to um, organize the protest, organize in a way that we could overcome the risks of uh, you know, deterioration. Damage to the state, damage to the society. This was a victory for the nation. And this was a victory of maturity, a victory of the strength of institutions. And this was also a result of this continuous work of the years, the strengthening of the civil society, the strengthening of the media. It is not to claim that they have come to a level of perfection, but it is to claim they have come to a level where which made it possible to, uh, to go through this process through a non-violent way and achieve this networking of this generated public discontent. Every citizen has been part of it. And the Prime Minister has been very clear, very, very often underlining this, that every citizen was participant of this process. Every citizen was an, the owner of the change, the owner of the revolution. And uh, when you will see the picture, there are a lot of emotional uh, you know, touches to this. But you will see that beam in which the people have been very confident about the way in which they take charge of their rights, of their destiny. Uh, what was subsequently happening in Armenia is also quite important and quite interesting. Uh, we have consistently, this protest has been generated on uh, this, you know, discontent about certain things that were not taking our country in the right direction. A country which was still going through the big damage of uh, the previous experiences of which uh, 2008 was perhaps the worst. When we had tragedy, when we had 10 deaths, uh, when we had uh, uh, serious deterioration. The uh, such such phenomena as corruption, uh, very low level of trust in institutions, public institutions, the judiciary, uh, low level of trust in uh, the electoral processes, and many other such phenomena. No, you know the deconstruction of equal opportunities for all in social and economic life. They have been layer by layer by layer. They have been building up this, uh, you know, uh, protest. <coughs> Several things have been very interesting to observe. That political will matters. When the prime minister and the new government declared that there will be no more requirement for the business people to carry suitcases to the powers that be, while there will be no distribution of wealth, while there will be equal opportunities for all, and everyone will be equal before the tax office. The rules have been generally accepted. And we have shown that it is possible to deal with corruption very quickly when there is political will. It is not to say that the question is resolved to an extent that we do not have to think about it anymore. The institutional strength remains a very important priority. But we have also seen the power of political will. 
when uh, the government introduced, uh, you know, when the government introduced, uh, no, not the government, in fact, it was still the majority because it was an interesting situation when the prime minister and the government were a significant minority in the parliament between May and December. But when the government introduced uh, changes to the electoral code, they were voted down by the then majority of the parliament. So we basically had the rules, the laws to uh, conduct elections according to what we had before. And we did hold the elections on the 9th of December 2019 in a way that, yes, they were accepted and they were um, you know, commanded by the international community, and that is very important. But what is mo most important is that they were accepted by the public of Armenia and by all the participants. Again, the most important thing here was political will. No electoral corruption, no uh, misconduct, strong will. With the existing laws, it's possible when you're serious. So again, another very interesting and important lesson I was very important for us. Uh, the other phenomenon with which we're dealing right now, we have to complete this resolution, the revolution. In order to consolidate and com complete the revolution, we have to achieve something, perhaps the most important, the genuinely independent and impartial petition. And that is today the biggest priority. Um, again, the government is absolutely determined to uh, introduce reforms, practical and legal, <coughs> which will uh, raise the level of trust in the public towards the judiciary in which every member of our society will uh, have reasonable trust in the judiciary. We believe this is, this is the ultimate objective of the present time. And uh, this is what we're working on, again, in partnership with our international, uh, 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 you know, with, with the international organizations, the Council of Europe, in this case, is the source of important expertise and knowledge. The European Union and uh, other donors are very supportive of this. And this is what we're dealing with today. This is what is on the table today as the most important priority. Finally, the uh, revolution may, be, may face vulnerabilities if we do not achieve reasonable progress in our economy. For that, again, the, what the Prime Minister defines as the, economic the priority of the economic revolution is also about networking the development, pushing the development through participation of the public, which is to say equal opportunities in economic and social life, expanding the pie, while we're dealing with the tax system. So those are the, in broad terms, those are what our government is dealing with today. Um, we continue to be very confident about the way in which our public life is organized, the role of the civil society, the, uh, risk, the accountability of the government before the public through many channels. The media, I am a member of the government, I may have often <coughs> be very unhappy about the media, but this is what is right. This is what is good, because you always feel the accountability. The method of work in which we engage with the civil society, most matters, in my case it is foreign affairs, in many other matters, every member of the government or every government agency is uh, actively engaging with the civil society on many issues. We have, for example, the uh, 
the uh, comprehensive and uh, enhanced partnership agreement with the European Union, which is a special format of uh, work which engages the civil society. The same concerns to me. From my angle, as the final point, the most important thing in all this was that what happened in Armenia in April, May 2018, what is happening in Armenia now is solely, strictly about Armenia. When you look at the pictures, when you will see the exhibition, you will note that it was about Armenia, that the only flag in all those demonstrations in the squares and streets of Armenia, there was only the tricolor of Armenia. And that was the whole message. There was no geopolitics in that. It was our internal matter. This is the kind of a country we want to build. This is all about us. And it's not about Europe. We had to go through certain phases, whether our revolution has certain implications in one direction or the other. And we have been patient enough to insist that uh, we, will, uh, we have been building a national security architecture in a careful way. And this is a responsible government, which will continue to be very sensitive about national security in a way, but rocking the boat is out of question. And we are faithful to our commitments internationally. We are faithful to our relations with all our partners. And we will carry on doing that. It took some time and patience to insist on this point. But we are very confident that uh, this is the right way. And uh, we do benefit from the multiple cooperation platforms we have in all important directions of uh, uh, Armenia's engagements. It's, it's a good feeling. It's good to be in Armenia. The spirit is good. And uh, whenever you have an opportunity, <coughs> I would be very glad to see you in the streets of Yerevan to test my assessment and see whether I'm right or whether I'm wrong. But uh, not to take it any further, I'm sure that my assessment will be tested already by the two other speakers, <laughs> and I will see how far I have been uh, right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you once again for joining us today. Uh, once again, it's a complex process. It's a difficult process. It's a process when uh, you have a huge support of the public, 71% of the vote of the genuine vote is not a small thing. It's a lot of confidence. But uh, it's a scary responsibility. Because you know that the people have given you a mandate for a reason. And it's a responsibility, a responsibility to deliver faithfully on that mandate. And this is the spirit with which our government, with the leadership of the Prime Minister, is. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I would like first of all to apologize about my voice. Since a week I'm suffering about allergy, so <clears throat> if you are not able to hear me, please, whenever I finish, ask me questions so I will be able to come back. I would like to thank uh, uh, Your Excellency for organizing this side event and involving me. Uh, I think it's not usual to see uh, countries uh, the day before the presentation of the report organizing side event and involving the reporter uh, that just visit the country uh, and will be presenting the report. Not to say that uh, <clears throat> the report is completely nice. There are so certain things that uh, uh, need to be improved. Uh, we discussed during my visit uh, with the minister, uh, with members of the government. Uh, 
not the task to say that uh, the reports contain or uh, say that everything is good in Armenia, but I think this for me shows really the readiness and the will for the government, the current government really to improve the situation on the ground. Uh, and for me it's also important uh, to attend such side events to also hear more about what's happened since my visit. And as you know, I visited Armenia last uh, November, and I have uh, uh, seven months after the Velvet Revolution. And this visit was particularly important for me because when I took the mandate, one of the things that I, I decided is also to use my mandate in order to be able to, to assist countries that are going through the transition to be able to build strong democracy, rule of law, but also strong civil society that is important for any democracy. And uh, during my visit in Armenia, I was also impressed uh, about the level of openness of the government. I was received by the deputy uh, prime minister, by the minister, and I met all of the government uh, members that I need in order to really uh, uh, discuss about issues that are important for me, which is the freedom of association and peaceful assembly. And we all see uh, from the TV how Armenians were able to go on the streets to claim democracy, to claim, uh, I would say, a new society. And during my visit also, I, I, I was able also to to hear first-hand information about how Armenians took this revolution as their revolution. Uh, for me, it's really important. I think the minister mentioned also one of the points, saying that uh, one thing probably that also changed in this revolution is that Armenia themselves, they stood up. And this revolution is their revolution. And they also, uh, in this spirit, you, I also noticed that Everybody, from where I was able to go, I visited uh, regions, uh, Gamri, Vanada, Vanada I visited also a uh, province, where I was able also to meet around the mining, the, 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 the protester that was protesting AMSO mining. I was able also to hear from them what is their concern. Uh, one thing that I noticed from there is really that all of Armenia feel that the revolution is their revolution. And it was imp it is important to highlight because it also changed in the, the nature of uh, commitments, both from the government but also for the society to build new democracy but also new way to live together. Uh, I also have the opportunity also to to discuss some of the issues uh, that are important. As you can see, during my visits was happening when we have the, the, world election. the election was planned for December, but also there was at, the, at, the, at that time, the Premier Minister Nicole, who also resigned to be able to organize, to, be, to, to, to organize a new election where his government can have a, uh, a majority at the parliamentarian in the parliament. So it means that the, the, it means that there was the situation is the situation where I'm facing is like a lot of violation happen, but the new government is not necessarily responsible for the, this violation. But the openness for the government to be able to provide me necessary information, but also to be able also in many cases also to. To, to recognize that some of those things happen, but they are ready to, to, to improve it, it was, it was cool. It was, for me, uh, important. Ladies and gentlemen, the Human Rights Defender or the Ombudsman of Armenia is the national human rights institution, an independent constitutional body. It is entrusted with a broad mandate of protection and promotion, effective observance and full enjoyment of human rights in Armenia, being in full compliance with the Paris, Paris Principles on the status of national institution, human rights institutions for the protection and promotion of human rights and enjoying a status 
The human rights defenders' activities include two fundamental directions. Human rights protection mainly by investigating complaints or individual situations and human rights promotion through contributing to the improvement of legislation, human rights education and awareness raising, breaking stereotypes and in general supporting <coughs> the improvement of human rights system and strengthening the rule of law in the country. And building a strong framework of human rights. And um, we're also greatly encouraged to hear the comments around uh, women, uh, women's human rights, both in, in this room and also earlier in the council chamber. Um, and the political process and the participation of women in the political process. Um, we also take note of the human rights offenders' comments, um, however, around um, hate speech. Um, and um, it's in this that we have um, some ongoing concerns, particularly relating to um, recent attacks on and hate speech towards uh, uh, women's human rights offenders. Um, last year, uh, um, was the 20th anniversary of the Declaration of <coughs> Human Rights Defenders. And one of the key messages to come out of the year, something that was um, reiterated in the uh, uh, General Assembly resolution that was passed by consensus, um, was the importance of uh, um, a strong positive narrative around human rights defenders um, in society, and particularly the onus on governments to be propagating um, a positive narrative, and it's really um, for us to urge um, the government of Armenia to take a very much a proactive um, step in um, strongly pro propagating um, a positive narrative around human rights defenders, um, particularly women's human rights defenders who in many uh, situations face um, extra vulnerabilities. Um, um, we know that um, Women, unfortunately, will continue to um, face these sorts of um, attacks, um, but when they have um, the clear and public and very strong support um, of the government behind them, um, uh, and when the general public understands the, uh, the nature and essential work of human rights defenders, and particularly um, women's human rights defenders, this goes a great way to um, combating the sorts of attacks um, that we've seen um, recently in Armenia. Thank you. Th thank you very much. Uh, uh, again, points very well taken on this, which are very strongly recognized by the government. And uh, in one of the important lessons that we know from our experience is that the, the, the most effective way of achieving a result is when you engage the public. You mentioned the attacks uh, on, on women's rights defenders or the, 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 those instances from, uh, the, from uh, other representatives of the, which had different views on this. The way in which I would, I would also draw a parallel about the way in which uh, the, the national debate, the domestic debate was taking place about domestic violence. There was a big, very complex debate about whether the government should be in a position to enter the uh, privacy of the family, or there were others who were raising the question of traditions, and there was a very, very complex and active public debate about it, which eventually brought to a rather more, perhaps not everyone is satisfied, but at least there is a considerable degree of consensus about the way we should deal with uh, domestic violence. And this is how we moved with the respective legal frameworks for this, uh, which has been a result, as I'm saying, of excessively you know, emotionally charged, difficult uh, debates. But this is the way in which we believe is uh, a real result, and, and tangible and sustainable result can be achieved. So uh, this is an ongoing thing. It is a never-ending point. But uh, the, for the government, the, again, I was mentioning the importance of political will. It is with this political will that we believe that the engaging nature of debate, public debate, engagement of the, of the public the, through their organization, civil society, and so on. Uh, the role of media, again, I want to uh, uh, bring up. 
uh, that uh, we believe we can uh, we can move on. Thank you. I'd like to address my question to Mr. Dorak Nasakanya. I have listened carefully to the processes that Armenian people has to in order to establish a democratic state and the preservation of democracy for the institution building. And I just would like to ask what measures does Armenia intend to take as a country that claims to be transitive to democracy? In other words, Taking into account the judgment of the European Court of Human Rights stated 16 June 2015 in Chicago and other stages of Armenia case, where the court recognized Armenia as exercising its control over the territories of Azerbaijan and which amounts to occupation under the terms of financial. Then will Armenia seize the occupation of the territories of Azerbaijan? And my second question is. When will Armenia stop the violation of the economic, social, and cultural rights of more than 800,000 Azerbaijani internal displaced persons whose rights have been violated since the very first day of the occupation? And I would like to put my question under the framework of democratic principles, democratic values, which should be carried out by democratic states in both this relations and policies internally, but also at the same time in these relations with external neighbors and other states, and which is required under the terms of and principles of Charter of the United Nations. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Nice try, I would say. Now, uh, look, we have been focused on what is happening in Armenia, and Armenia is very confident about the democratic process that is happening. And uh, we believe that democracy in the region, in all countries of the region, would be a great contribution to peace and stability in the entire region. Now, coming back to Nagorno-Karabakh, I had the opportunity to speak about it earlier in the morning, and I would want to come back to it again. In fact, this is something that we, we have been quite vocal including in the negotiations. Nagorno-Karabakh is a people. There are 150,000 very real people in Nagorno-Karabakh who have names, who have families, who have homes, and who have serious existential physical security concerns. Why? Because uh, one might want to be reminded that 70 years of jurisdiction of Azerbaijan over Nagorno-Karabakh has been uh, laced with continuous systematic discrimination. That uh, in the early years uh, of, uh, uh, in the early 1990s, there was a moment, or there were occasions when over 40% of the territory of Nagorno-Karabakh was under the control of Azerbaijan. Over 40% of the population of Nagorno-Karabakh has been cleansed. There was a moment where there might be no discussion on Nagorno-Karabakh because there might be no Nagorno-Karabakh at, at all. There were subsequent, very continuous, government-led hate propaganda, hatred, armenophobia, which have been raising seriously our claim about the threats to existential physical security. The glorification of a murderer, Ramil Safarov, is a case in point. When uh, a psychopath kills an Armenian officer in the middle of the night, a sleeping officer, and then turns up in Azerbaijan and is received as a hero of a nation for the fact of killing an Armenian, is something to reflect upon for the public of Azerbaijan. When it is repeated, because it is a sign of encouragement, and when it is repeated subsequently during the aggression against Nagorno-Karabakh in April 2016, it is also something to reflect upon for the public of Azerbaijan. So it is all about the human being, 
those human beings in Nagorno-Karabakh, 150,000 of them, and their existential physical security. Are, there is no other security arrangement for these people than the one that exists today. Armenia is a guarantor for the security of Nagorno-Karabakh because there isn't any other guarantee. Will we accept a situation when, uh, again, we face the obliteration? No. Do we want peace? Absolutely. Is there an alternative to peace? So, so this is something to reflect upon. So this is a subject that I'm very glad to engage, although it is far beyond the purpose of what we're doing. But you ask for it, you have it. Thank you.